All right, well, Kirk, thank you for hanging out with us today here at the Austin Board of Realtors. Our listeners um, have obviously are aware of the fact that we're heading into big change here in the city of Austin. We're excited to see yeah. your leadership in that change. Let's start with something easy. Um, tell me what's most important to you as you're looking at, at what the city's facing right now. Well, what's most important to me is whether or not we create um, generational inequity. Mm. You know, I, I love this town. Of course, you do too. And, and the people watching this love Austin or we wouldn't be here. Right. And, and when I got here, uh, when Liz and I moved here, there was excess capacity. There was uh, there, there was abundance. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you could get anywhere you needed to get. You know, the roadways, there, there, there was uh, excess capacity on our roads and parks and clean air and housing. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Liz and I didn't have much when we got here, but we were still able to cobble together enough money to get into that first house. And I really... I, what I really want is my two granddaughters who are, you know, almost five and almost two, when they're the age I was when I got here, I want them to feel about Austin the same way. Of course, everybody's got somebody like my two granddaughters in their lives. So so that's that's I want to make sure that the the next generation doesn't feel like we left them with nothing yeah. when we had so much. Yeah. So obviously you had tenure in this position and tenure at council um, and made policy decisions then, right? right. So, some of which might have positively impacted where we were, I believe so, um, but some that could have negatively too. Some critics would say that some of the policies that you put in place as it relates to land use didn't do us any favors with where we are today. Well, and, and, and I would debate that. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly 2020 hindsight, looking back, I'll bet I could nitpick some of my decisions <laughs> too. Yeah. Um, but the truth of the matter is that um, we were facing the same, some of the very same things that we, we face today um, in terms of how do you manage the success we're having. Uh, you know, a lot of our problems, and I'm very optimistic about our future because a lot of our big challenges are the result uh, not of having to manage decay, mm. but they're the result of enormous success. Right. People come here. And, so we there was a lot of effort to manage that. But but for example, when I was elected mayor, um, there were only about three places you could live in downtown Austin. Mm. And people said, Watson, you can't get more housing in downtown Austin. People just won't do it. They won't live down there. And I kept saying, well, you've created this sort of zero-sum game, but I bet we can pull that off. And if you look at what we did, mm -hmm. that was part of the land use efforts that made, made a big difference. We also made some real progress in terms of dealing with things like... Um, uh, how we deal with you know, closing the airport and mm. turning turning that into what is a nationally recognized model for how you reclaim a big chunk of land. Um, that that was something that we needed to get done. In fact, I walked I, I, uh, I block walked yesterday in Miller <laughs> in the Miller neighborhood, and it's a it's a tremendous neighborhood. And we also addressed some of the issues that needed to be addressed in in terms of environmental racism. Mm. Um, I remember one of the first things we did from a land use perspective was we created the East Austin zoning overlay so that you, because there were so many resident, in this residential area, you had so many pieces of property that were zoned industrial. Mm. You literally had houses, residences on property that was, that was industrially zoned. And so we created the overlay to address as part of the, the land use, we created that overlay so that, that you would change that mm -hmm. and, um, and allow for, for people to, 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 to be able to enjoy having their homes and their residences there. Um, and, and, and frankly, one of the things that that did, uh, for, based on your question about um, some might criticize, that, in, in a lot of ways, in my view, because it made it a, a, a more desirable place to be, had some effect on gentrification. Sure. And now, looking back, there are things we can do better as we move forward and learn from anything like that, because it's just too bad that people that fought to get those kinds of land use changes made aren't the ones getting the opportunity as a general rule, to enjoy the outcomes as much. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you you said something important when you said that these were intentional things that happen over time. You know, what has happened to Austin as we've grown has been both a tremendous success and with it brings challenges right. because there's a give and a take in the balance of that. And I think with housing especially, we feel the tug and the pull 
of that give and the take. We love that everybody wants to be here. We love that we've created a desirable community. It's hard to find a home for everybody because sure we've is, grown yeah. so quickly and we haven't put that infrastructure in place. Well, and, and, and that's a very important point that you just made. If you, st if you stop and think about, I was at a meeting the other night where we were talking about the arts. Mm -hmm. We weren't talking about housing. We were talking about the arts. And some people that have only been here like two and a half to three years from California were saying, why is there not more art? Uh. Uh, more cultural arts. Do they mean buildings with people's names well, on them? That's part of what they meant, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, but what I was trying to explain to them is you don't really fully appreciate, because you hadn't been here long enough, how fast mm. this growth has occurred. If you think about when I was mayor the first time, um, we were things were booming. I mean, that was the first. I, I kind of navigated, helped navigate through our first big tech boom. But the truth of the matter is, that was fast, and then it, in the last 10 years, you build on that mm -hmm. how much growth with the speed that we've had now, it makes it very difficult to keep up unless you are very purposeful and you are willing to try new things. Yeah. And I think, too, it's, you know, the other thing that we experience is the community's response to that growth. Yes. It's, that's, the t that's where the tug hurts. You're right. A little bit. Right. You know, we appreciate that everybody thinks Austin's great as long as it's not happening in my backyard. So how will you approach that conversation differently with the community? How can we prioritize housing in a way that is meaningful while also maintaining the character of the community that we love? Well, I think a couple of things that need to be done in that regard. One is you have to be willing to say it the way you just said it. You can't set this up as an all or nothing, us versus them. Yeah. I said, I used the words a minute ago, zero sum game. It, it does not have to be two, a two party system, pro housing, no housing, yeah. right? And so you have to, we have to look at it. And by the way, I think that's been part of the problem in the last decade, right. is it's been too much of that. So what you have to do is you have to look at it from how do we create situations where you can have, you, you can recognize that changing by allowing for more housing can actually work to benefit neighborhoods. But an, an, an example, if, if you have, uh, and I'm gonna go back, I'll come back to this many, many times. I believe that when Project Connect was passed, mm -hmm. it was not just to create a foundation for transportation. I believe it was a vote on housing. Mm. And I, I think that for a couple of reasons. One is you have to have more density for Project Connect to be successful. Yeah. And I don't think the voters voted for an unsuccessful uh, enterprise. In addition, so, so you need to have that density, but in addition, there was the vote by the people to have uh, $300 million in displacement dollars, which was directly related to the concept of housing. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of this, if we do it right, is we can allow for there to be greater housing and greater density along those transit lines in a way that benefit neighborhoods so that, for example, that don't have places to eat. Mm -hmm. or places to have retail shops so that, that, that they're, they're walkable and be able to participate in that. So we've got to get ourselves away, and, 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 and we've been doing this, of it's an all or nothing. It's either my way or the highway, and we've got to think through how we do some of those things. But how do you prioritize housing in the way that is needed, given how, how far off the track we are right now of, of supply and demand? in a way that still allows people to feel comfortable with the change. Well, I mean, so, what, what do we do tactically for sure. that? Sure, so well, let's, let's start with the past decade. We've been stagnant, yeah. in my view. Uh, we've, we've, we have identified the problem. Oh, we've, we've beat the problem yeah, to death. Yeah, yeah, that's right, we know what the, exactly, <laughs> we, got the we know what the problem pegged. is. But then we immediately put on different jerseys and set up yes. a way to do it. One of the things that I've said is, can we now take a, a, a pause and say, that's not going to work the way you were doing it, so let's experiment with other things. And those experimentations are to listen to mm. what people are asking for and try to, one size isn't gonna fit all, and, and then try to address those needs um, as part of the planning process. Mm -hmm. And not just and not just say, we're gonna do this whether you like it or not. 
most folks, even those that are fearful of what, say, for example, Code Next was bringing, mm -hmm. they still get that we need more housing. Go back to what I was saying at the beginning. They get that they have grandchildren or children that they're going to want to be able to stay near them in Austin. They want leadership that will be willing to experiment, to try to figure, listen, to try to figure out other ways as opposed to what I think probably was part of the difficulty of the past decade. This is the way to do it. I want to win the war, but I only want to win it my way. Yeah. I think what's tricky about it is maintaining that priority. Absolutely. Keeping housing at the top of the tab and then still allowing people to, to feel comfortable with it. But obviously... There's some learning has to go with that. And, and I don't, quite a bit. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think... I, what you, you said is very true. You have to always keep it as a priority, and it, it, it's the number one priority. Cost of living in this community and housing is the first part of that. That is almost a, it's almost universally understood and appreciated. But the next part of that is how do we communicate that this isn't something that we're coming in to try to do to you. It is instead something we want to join with you to help design your children and grandchildren's also. And I guess what I would say is it's universally accepted and understood and yet not reflected in the policy decisions that have been made to date. So as we look towards leadership to make change in this city, we look for opportunity for those policy decisions to reflect what we all know to be true. Austin is unaffordable today. Right. Right. Um, you released a plan uh, mm -hmm. naming some of the, the kind of new concepts that you bring forward to help us address that and help provide for some affordability. Talk to me about some of the elements of the plan. Sure. Well, um, let's start with the idea of what we've, we've, I've been bumping up against and talking about a little bit in this conversation so far. And that is, in my view, the last part of the reason we've been stagnant for the last decade is because it was set up to be a zero sum game. Yeah. It was all or nothing. This is what we're going to do. And we're going to do it, quote, as a comprehensive if not, not only are we not going to just change the wording of the code, which might be a nice place to start, mm -hmm. um, and but we're also going to just redo it, rezone it. It, it. It's done. And what happened is that it ran into uh, law, the law and certain protections that say you have to do certain things if you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And it was so uh, all or nothing that it was the city was willing to be sued and take it all the way to an appellate court where both the district court and the appellate court said, you can't do what you say you're going to do. So what we ended up with was pretty much nothing. It's nothing, right. And so what I've laid out is a proposal that says, okay, that didn't work. It's not going to work, at least the way it was done. So we can we say, let's look and, and go back to where I was started and ask people, what is it you want? Mm. And, and, and the way I've said it is, you know, if, a, if a, a council member in District X comes forward and says, you know, I thought that was really great for my district. I want that. That could come forward, be brought to the entire council, would have to have a vote of the council. There may even still be valid petitions and those kinds of things that need to be dealt with, probably would be. Mm -hmm. But then you've got a situation where other council members, it's not directly impacting them. So maybe we can get more. Maybe it's not Project Connect, but it's more than what we had. Every district would still be subject to meeting a baseline. Um, you know, and right now, I guess our baseline is the blueprint on housing, where it says you have to, you know, every district has to do something. So it's not saying, well, you don't have to do anything now. It's it, You still have a baseline. Yeah, and I think that's critical because obviously, you know, East Austin didn't turn into East Austin that it is today on accident. We made right. intentional decisions to allow that kind of development there and to prevent it from happening in other areas of Austin, yes. which has led to gentrification and uncomfortable change in communities that have been displaced. But for you to say, and, and it's very critical, which is why I want to call attention to it, that there be equity in the, the baseline expectations of every district across the community is what will provide housing for everyone everywhere. That's right. And, and, and that's a very important point. And so... And, and has to be emphasized. Yes. But there's a couple of other things to add to that. 
One is that if you're making changes that are citywide changes to the land development code, like what's being discussed right now sure. by council, my proposal doesn't say any one district can say, well, we're not going to do that. Right. If, they're, if you're going to make zoning, land development code changes that impact the entire city, they impact the entire city. Right. And um, in addition to that, if there are priorities such as transit corridors, and you're going to, in my view, part of my plan for transit corridors, I've just told you, I think it's a housing plan. Right. Is that in some of those, in some parts of those transit corridors, I want there to be minimums of what can be put mm -hmm. there, as opposed to Austin's way of saying this is the maximum you can build. I want it to be the minimums. Things like how do you get better, get more ADUs, or mm -hmm. how do you how do you create the opportunity for this lot to not just have a McMansion on it, but maybe a duplex, triplex, or fourplex? Those kinds of things would apply across the board. Yeah. And 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 then the, the final thing I want to say about that is my, what my plan also did was so that we approached equity mm -hmm. and we created incentives for doing that is it says if a district is doing more and faster mm -hmm. than what other districts are doing, then what we will do is we will say that that district is incentivized by, because it's adding more to the tax base, which mm -hmm. by the way, I, I worry about that 20 years from now, how we afford this city if we're not becoming more dense. Right. But in any event, what we say then is, um, you're growing the tax base more, you're going beyond, or at least faster than anybody else with regard to our citywide baseline. <clears throat> so you will get tax revenue mm. that can be used for things like anti-displacement, rent, rent help, um, parks, playgrounds, libraries, those kinds of things. Yeah. And frankly, if the uh, if other areas don't do well, even hitting their baseline, then you can also prioritize what happens in those districts. Mm -hmm. You know, we only have so much money on in the general fund to do new swimming pools or lifeguards at swimming pools. Where we're going to have well, we're going to have them in those parts that are meeting our number one priority. Right. So you, you try to build equity into that system. And then I said that was the last thing I was going to say about this, but I'll say one other thing. This is my effort to do two things, to show how I think about things, which is we have to be willing to think out of the box. And I'm convinced Austin is smart enough to wrap its head around more than just two sides of an issue. Mm. And so I'm willing to experiment and not fear that, it, okay, that may not work for whatever reason, but I'm inviting people to say, oh, here's a problem, here's, but, here, but then say, here's how you fix it, right? Yeah. I want ideas like, I think to make this work, it's going to have to have a thousand mothers. Mm -hmm. We need a mayor who has done some of this stuff, has been able to achieve some of the, get things done, and is willing to embrace new ideas. Yeah. I mean, what's most critical about what you're saying from the Austin Board of Realtors perspective and, and mine is that you'll, you'll set the baseline for equity's sake, ensure that housing is prioritized uh, across the city in a way that's meaningful, and then allow districts that want to step up in that problem to help us solve it step up and be incentivized to do so. That's exactly right. Which engages right. the community in solving the problem. Yep. So I, I appreciate your perspective and approach on that. Look, the, the way that Code Next has gone down, even as a significant proponent of it here, right. here at ABOR, um, was clearly not impactful and, and wasn't going to make the change that we needed to make. So we have to approach it differently we than have we have. To. We have to. Not only because the court told us so now, but because we have a community that expects us to step up in the problem. So that's, I appreciate that's exactly that. exactly right. Um, you've been uh, somewhat criticized for a yard sign. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that obviously related to Code Next, related right. to what happened there. Um, just tell me a little bit about what happened and... and and what's going to happen next? <laughs> we had a yard sign that was anti-code next. Yeah. And and a, a big reason that I didn't support code next is, is that it, in my view, go back to what I was saying a minute ago about how do you engage, it was an all or nothing deal, and how, and how do you engage others to, to get them to come along as opposed to saying, we ain't even going to give you notice. And we're not even going to recognize what the law allows in terms of a valid petition. Your ability to object 
to this. Yeah. And we're willing to have you even sue us and we'll fight it. And okay, well, okay, now you're right, right? Right. And, and that, in my view, was not the way you make major change. Mm -hmm. um, but isn't it something that here you and I are sitting here talking about a dadgum yard sign yeah. when we have these problems. The idea that we're talking about a yard sign when we have these big housing problems is some evidence of why we haven't made very much Well, of progress. the dysfunction junction that is That's lost. exactly right. That's <laughs> um, exactly right. And, and, you know, I know you enough and understand your commitment to housing enough at this point to understand that you cannot like the process and still understand the power of the policy. Absolutely. And and it's okay to say that Code Next was a broken process because it was. Well, it, it was. <laughs> or we wouldn't be where That's we right. are today. That's exactly right. And, um, and I'll say one other thing since we're talking to realtors. Yeah. Realtors help people find, in many instances, their most valuable asset, the thing they've, like I said a minute ago, they've cobbled together that little bit of money yeah. that puts them into their home, um, and now they, they, that's going to be the basis of their wealth. And we say that all the time, right? Yeah. As, as people that support realtors and realtors themselves say, mm -hmm. this is one of the ways that people can, can develop wealth. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm never going to strip somebody of their right to protest government mm -hmm. taking an action that they believe will do damage to that. Mm -hmm. Now, I may disagree with them. I may decide they're wrong. I may even vote against them. But I'm not going to try to take away their right to, to at least protest that. That's a real dangerous path to take, particularly if you're trying to create citywide major generational policy or just give them notice. Right. Uh, those are those are pretty important well, things to me. They're minimum expectations of yeah. citizens who deserve the right to That's know. That's right. <laughs> so moving on, um, we've released a report earlier this year related to development fees and yeah. the impact that the development fees in the city of Austin have, especially on the final cost of the product of housing. Um, and, and wrapped the context of, hey, it is far more expensive to build a house here than it is anywhere else in the state um, and certainly anywhere else in the region. How will you help approach the development fees? Well, that report actually got quoted when I released my plan. Yeah, um, and, we appreciate that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, because it, it was important and it came out at a great time for me to really, when I was releasing my plan. But my point being that, that one of the things that I put in, in my plan mm -hmm. is that we should, in this housing, what I call a housing emergency, because I want to emphasize we need to move with urgency like we do in most emergencies. One of the things I think we ought to do is we ought to be willing to say that we will cut development fees up to 50% on certain types of, of uh, projects. Mm -hmm. So that what we do is, again, we prioritize housing and we don't, you know, I've said it before and, and and I'll say it again, the fees that the city charges for legitimate reasons in some instances, but those fees are what we've made, mm -hmm. right? We've created those. I say we, uh, I haven't gotten there yet, but, um, but I'll be part of all that. And, and what, I, what, what I think we can then do is say, all right, our priorities are X. Let's not let the fact that we've created this fee get in the way of achieving this goal. In fact, let's use it to achieve the goal. And if you recall, one of the questions you asked earlier was about land use uh, previously. That was one of the things that we did, mm. is we, um, we figured out ways to take our fees, in some instances waive those fees, and others make them more affordable, so that we would incentivize the kind of growth that we were trying to manage. And we, it's, it's time for us to do that, particularly when you show the statistics that Abor has shown. Yeah, and it's I think it's lost on people sometimes that the developer will build what the market will yield, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? They're they're not in a, on a mission to only build million dollar houses, but we've made it so unaffordable to build anything else here that that's what we're left with, and the supply and demand chain is so far off that the lot starts at that price yeah. point, you know, and then they've got to figure out how to net something on it at some point. But um, it's not, the, the developers don't move into a community with the intention of making it unaffordable. We have done that well, based on the decisions we, we, that we've we have, made. We have very definitely contributed to that. And, and part of my plan is to say, let's, let's fix that. Let's be willing to experiment in the ways that make it even better. Sure. 
And, um, you know, of course, one of the things I've, I've called for is a, a sunset review process, if you will, of the entire uh, development process. Yeah. And that fees mm -hmm. clearly needs to be a part of that. Right. Um, when, when the time comes to set out and say, now make sure you don't miss these things, that report ought to be a key part of that. Yeah, and then how do we look at the operations that correspond to it? Well, These are enterprise departments. That, well, now, yeah. Every dollar they raise in those, you know, in the far more expensive cost of building housing here goes right back to the department who then in turn asks for more full-time staff. And they need more full-time staff in part because the code is complex and it's yes. hard to understand and that's, that's hard on the staff team. But, um, you know, we raise questions at some point about the operational efficiency of the department overall and how that adds to cost. Well, so let me be clear on what I'm saying. Um, I was on the Texas Sunset Commission for many years and um, really came to value how they can do a review top to bottom, you know, soup to nuts. And in fact, 10 years ago, I, I made, I had Capital Metro go through the sunset review process yeah. to, to look at the efficiencies and, and best practices and how you do all those kinds of things. And that has to happen, in my view, and it has to happen quickly. It's not something that you take a long time on. I would do it through the city auditor. Mm -hmm. uh, the auditor reports to the mayor and council. But and, and I and I recognize, and people that are watching this will also say, yeah, but but we've had all these studies and we've had all these reports. Well, what I want, to, and I get that. Yeah. Lord knows I get that. But that's where you, that part of where you start this. You know, the Zucker report just a couple of years ago. Yeah. Take that and hand it oh, to your... 10 years ago now. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's, yes, faster. <laughs> Might be time, out of date. Time, time moves. <laughs> but that, but you, can, you can take that and look at it and start yeah. it. But then it has to be enacted. And we got to elect, we got to elect leadership that is in the past proven that they'll take things and they'll move on. Them. Sure. So the other uh, big cost of living in Austin is not just the house itself, but it's the ha having the house, the tax mm -hmm. bill, the utility bill, all the things that go into that total cost. How will you guys, or how will you help address through the city the cost of utilities and taxes? Yeah, that's a, great, that's a thank you for that question. Sure. Um, well, so here's where I start on that. There's there's so much that the mayor will not be able to control when it comes to cost of living. I'm not going to be able to control mortgage costs, right? Yeah. You know, there's nothing I can <laughs> Me do. Me neither. About We're going to yeah. work on that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I can't control insurance costs. Sure. Um, you know, supply chain issues, all those kinds of things, inflation. Um, and so what that says to me is not, well, I can't control it. It is instead, I better focus like a laser on those things I can control. Yeah. Fees are one of those things that we just talked about. Um, because it, it, it takes you back to a basics type of local government. And I think that's very important. When it comes to property taxes, you know, the, the state has put a cap on what the city can charge mm -hmm. in, in terms of increasing its rate. But that doesn't mean that the city should start mm. at the higher rate. In my view, you know, from my experience, both as a mayor dealing with city budgets and my experience serving so many years on the Senate Finance Committee dealing with the state budget mm -hmm. is that what we ought to do is we ought to start at the no new revenue mm -hmm. rate. In other words, we're going to keep the rate at a, a put the rate at an amount where we get the same amount of revenue we got the year before, mm -hmm. and we start then because because new growth that doesn't count against that. You know, like last year, my my, my memory is it was like twenty two million dollars mm -hmm. in new in new revenue from new growth that doesn't impact the, right. the current tax payer. Right. So you go with that, you go with your sales tax, you look at other parts of the budget, but you start there. Now it may very well be that you increase because you have needs, mm -hmm. but you should have to justify that mm -hmm. increase as opposed to starting out here and now you're faced with cuts. Mm -hmm. The budget process should not start with having to figure out how high you go, mm -hmm. it, ought to be, it ought to be starting there. So that's that's the first step in all that. Sure. We own our own electric utility. <laughs> One of the great advantages, and I've, I spent a lot of time in the Texas legislature mm -hmm. defending that electric utility and keeping it in, in Austin's hands. The beauty of that, or one of the beauties of that, is it allows us to make decisions that can impact the shareholders and the utility users. Sure. And so we ought to pay attention to that. For example, the, 
the current rate increase. I, I, I must admit, it bothers me that we're at, that the, the utility is asking for a rate increase when we are in a cost of living emergency. Right. You don't get don't don't tell me we're in a an affordability crisis and then bring things that add to the affordability crisis. You don't get to be both the victim and the perpetrator. Yeah. And so we ought to look at it in that way. Sure. With regard to water, um, there are a number of things that I think we ought to be doing that will help us in that regard. I could go into detail of things I, I did in the past when I was mayor, securing our water future, things I did in the Senate to deal with the water management plan. Sure. But if we were to do a more aggressive reuse, mm -hmm. we could probably even help in some of the, uh, in, in, you know, some of the cost um, because we would be able to have that water at a lower cost when we use it for chilling, we use it for um, irrigation, that kind of thing. And that ought to be a priority as well. Yeah. Well, Kirk, the breadth of your experience is meaningful. And it's, Thank you. it's going to make a difference in your leadership, we believe. Um, but what do you feel like you most bring to the table in terms of just pushing these issues forward, working across a council dais in a way that will lead to real impact? Well, I have a history uh, that, it, that you can point to that is a history of being able to build coalitions even when people don't think there can be coalitions. Uh, folks that watch this that remember when I was elected the first time, there was a de facto two-party system. Mm -hmm. It was uh, that we would never be able to break through, and it was environment versus development, mm -hmm. part of the land yeah. use that we were talking about. It was Save Our Springs versus the Chamber of Commerce, the Real Estate Council versus Sierra Club. And as people said, that zero-sum game will never be broken. But yet I was able to find ways to bring that together and bring an end to that. Um, so I guess what one of the things I say is I have a demonstrated experience being able to bring people together, build coalitions, but also listen and create the big ideas, mm -hmm. everything from medical schools at the University of Texas at Austin to, like I said, bringing people together or what we see in our downtown and then making it happen. Yeah. So I would say a proven record of coalition building, a proven record of getting things done and um, making sure that the things that we're getting done move the city forward. Well, I know that we want you to have the ability to exercise all of those Thank skills uh, and are happily, you know, endorsing your candidacy. It means a lot to me. Looking forward to your leadership. And we're excited about the next chapter of Austin. So thank you. Thank you. You bet.